Without further delay, I'd like to give a warm welcome to Ashley McKinnon, founder of The Rehearsal Room. For more information on Ashley, please go to the session page to check out her bio. And with that, I'll hand it over to Ashley. Thank you, Tiana. Um, hello, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining in our last, I think the last breakout session for the two day convening. Um, so in this session, we're gonna be talking about navigating tokenism primarily and predominantly white institutions, uh, especially in our art department as we are educators of color. Um, before we dive directly into that work, um, I'm gonna share my screen so you can see, here we go. Um, let's give you a little bit of background about myself. I um, am a dance educator and choreographer and mentor. I've taught in the d, &D area for 10 years now, um, predominantly in PWI spaces, which is why this topic is so near and dear and informing to me. Um, I was a member of the AAC cohort number two, which is how I got introduced to AAC, so I'm very grateful for that. Um, and I still perform in the area as a dancer, and I recently just founded the, the Rehearsal Room, which is an experiential program for professional dance training and mentoring for young aspiring artists. Um, and just a fun fact about me is that I super am obsessed with Josephine Baker and Lady Gaga. Um, those are my two artistic muses. Um, and I'm actually wearing a Josephine Baker shirt today because I can. <laughs> so in this session, we're going to uh, define what tokenism is. We're going to work through some ways of how to amplify the BIPOC educator voice and how to explore incorporating DEI work into our curriculum using the anti-bias education uh, core goals. And then after that, uh, hopefully we can come up uh, with some brainstorming or creating new policies and initiatives that we can take back into our spaces now and implement in the short term. So to begin with, I figured we should go over a little bit of what uh, DEI is. We already know that DEI is diversity, equity, and inclusion, but the definition that I have here on the slide um, puts it more in terms of the who and the what. So for diversity, it's asking the question of who is in the room and who is missing from the room. Equity asks the question, who has the tools and the resources that they need once they're in the room? And then inclusion asks, whose culture and story is normalized and who has a say in policy and procedures that happen in the room. So many of times we can check boxes with diversity, we can give a little bit here and there, allocate as needed for equity, but we miss a lot of the inclusion, which is how we steer ourselves towards tokenism. Uh, here we have a sample statement of a DEI statement from a predominantly white institution in the DMV area, which is where I'm located. Um, it's actually a school where I worked for four years. Um, and I blacked out the name to protect their innocence, so to speak. Um, but if you were to read through it, you will also see that it's more checking boxes of what they should be looking for. They named all the eight big identifiers with age, ability, ethnicity, race, things of that uh, nature, but they uh, are leaving out the parts of inclusion. When you look at DEI, the DEI movement was meant to pool ideas and strength from a wide pool of people in order to creatively solve problems and, and to um, innovate. And most statements from PWI institutions are not creatively solving problems. They are simply bringing the people into the room, but where they are in the room determines the access that they have to actually innovating and solving problems. So to help with this presentation, I created a survey that I sent out to about 50 art educators of color um, that are within my personal network and other networks that I'm a part of um, to participate in about how they view tokenism and how they view um, having a voice as a BIPOC teacher in PWI spaces. So just to give you a little bit of background, 
85% of the participants were Black, 8% were Latino or Hispanic, and then 7% were white. Half of them have worked in a PWI setting or an independent private school setting, and then about a third of them currently work in that setting. Um, and then what speaks to the presentation today is that over half of them have said that they do feel tokenized at some point as an educator of color in the arts department. So here we have a picture of token. If you are, which is the actual guy in the corner, if you're familiar at all with South Park, um, then this is the main character. His name is Token Black, um, or his real last name is Williams. Um, but he was used to portray the token black guy that every group of friends has on TV or in the movies. So they just named him token, um, which I find really, really bold and extremely true. Because even though he was piloted, he was put on the show in the very first episode, his character never evolved and never changed. He was always the token person that they kept the entire time. And if we remember any of South Park's uh, controversy, it was not the most, well, it wasn't PC, like, at all. Um, I wasn't allowed to watch it until I got much older. Uh, so seeing this picture of token truly defines what tokenism looks like. Uh, the definition that I have here on the slide is the result of diversity without inclusion. So it's bringing people into the room, bringing people into the school, bringing people into the environment, and then stopping right there. Having no say, no story, no opinion, no contribution. Just, you got here, we're done. <laughs> so getting invited to the party, but still standing in the corner and making no friends. Um, tokenism also can be seen in school environments. Uh, such as the one song that performed at the Winter Assembly about Kwanzaa, or the one time that you build an altar for Dia de los Muertos in October, and then we never talk about any other part of Mexican culture. Or it could be International Night, but all you do is serve food, as opposed to talk about the connection of that food to the culture, because everybody loves food. Um, but it also minimizes the impact that these cultures have. And in PWI settings, they typically tend to use uh, BIPOC educators as a voice, or not a voice necessarily, but as a, a presentation to say, here, it's, look what we have, as opposed to here, look at the contribution of what we have, has done in order to increase us, increase us and bring us to a new place. So, According to the survey that was taken by the participants, 31% said that they felt tokenized in situations of contributing to holiday or seasonal assemblies, 23% when they provided, had to provide resources to another colleague or somebody about their own racial background, and then 23% when they were asked to spearhead or join an initiative on DEI when it had nothing to do with their actual responsibilities and their job. Um, the one that I found the most interesting was the 23% about speaking about their own racial background because, in, you know, when George Floyd was killed uh, the end of May, beginning of the summer, every white person just got super guilty and just wanted to, like, do better and, you know, ask for resources and started book clubs and all the teachers at the school where I was teaching, uh, you know, were, like, emailing and calling, like, do you have any resources? And I was like, yes. Google. I have Google. And so <laughs> instead of coming to me to be your provider, you should do the work so that you are educated. Because you expect me to become educated about your stuff, but you're not becoming educated about my stuff. Um, so here listed under examples are some of the different things that the participants put into the survey. Um, and so what I wanted to see is if there were other examples of tokenism that people have experienced, um, either in a PWI education session, a school, or whether or not it's in some other type of area if you're not necessarily in education. And just putting those into the chat as a way of, one, knowing that we're not by ourselves, right? And two, 
knowing that there are there are community people that are able to brainstorm and think about different ways to come oops to come up with ways to uh, solve those issues. I'm trying to figure out how to make how do I not make the thing on this side? That's not a question. That was a very horrible question. <laughs> oh, found it. I think I found it. Actually, no, I can't see the chat. That's what it is. Kiana, can you just tell me if there are things in the chat? Because I don't think I can see it. Yes. So okay. let Thank me. You. Robert had offered Amazon. I know Kareem is tough for you, but you are the best person to deal with him because you're a black man. Exactly. And that goes back also to one of the things on this slide where it says you can relate to a student simply because you look like them. Or you can speak to this issue simply because you are probably a part of that. For me, the last bullet point is exactly um, how I was viewed when I was hired by the last school where I worked. Uh, the previous teacher was a white teacher who specialized in modern dance. And they hired me and they said, well, we really hope that you can use more hip hop because that seems to be what the student body likes. Um, and while I did hip hop, my degree in dance is in modern dance. And I perform modern dance with a professional company. So I was like, oh, okay, you clearly only want me for one thing. Um, so it's just a matter, so that it's showing that how they use what we have for themselves. But later in the presentation, I'm gonna talk about how we can do that for ourselves. So amplifying the BIPOC educator voice, uh, just a little bit more statistics about the survey. 62% of respondents said that their admin and staff were more than 50% white. 30% of the respondents think that the school leadership does reflect their racial identity, which means 70% do not. And then only 38% of the respondents are not in charge of their own curriculum. So over a third of BIPOC educators have to get approval or are being told what to teach to their students. Um, in 2003, there was a national percentage of 10% of teachers of color in PWI settings, and now, uh, in 2020, there is a percentage somewhere around 15%. So that means in a school of 100 teachers, about 15 of them are people of color. And most PWIs go from K to 12th grade on one campus. So that might be one person per grade. And that usually includes staff as well. So then when you take out, <laughs> when you put staff in, some grades are missing. Uh, uh, BIPOC uh, representation. Some of the suggestions that were taken from the survey uh, about how to correct some of the DI deficiencies were based on hiring, offering leadership positions, and then incorporating artists of color into the curriculum. So just as most white educators in PWI settings ask for us to contribute to their platform to increase them, I say flip it and to use them to increase us. So through two different methods of social and cultural capital. Um, social and cultural capital is something that is the norm of uh, white culture, and it should be used also for our benefit. So social capital is networking um, of people with shared norms and values that understand uh, an understanding that facilitate cooperation within or among groups. So it's basically the who you know and who you're connected to and how to use those people to get to where you need to go. Cultural capital is the what you know. So it's the accumulation of cultural assets and knowledge, such as education, intellect, dress, speech, status, power, et cetera, um, in order to display worth and value. Um, so using what we have in our BIPOC community, we often think that we need to chisel it or fit it into the peg that they are giving to us. Uh, so whether it's a round peg and we have square material, we feel we need to chisel our social and cultural capital to go into the 
a round hole. However, I suggest that we cut our own square hole and put our square knowledge into the square hole at their table. So three ways of doing this through hiring, leadership opportunities, and curriculum development. For hiring would be utilizing professional networks and contacts for ourselves and elevating others as we seek promotion. So one thing, unfortunately, that BIPOC communities do not always do for each other is lift up one another as we are also lifting ourselves up. So as we seek promotion in our environment, we also pull someone in to fill the void of what we will be leaving. So we don't just take the opportunity, we bring someone else into an opportunity as well. For leadership opportunities, uh, the most important one I feel is number two that says leveraging the social climate for urgency in leadership change. So using that white guilt, especially now um, in this climate, to say it is necessary to have this type of representation. It is necessary to have these types of people making the decision. Um, as, as a mate, awesome as it is that uh, Kamala Harris is gonna be vice president, Joe Biden, use the social climate to know it is necessary to have a black woman in leadership right now. <laughs> so I'm glad he recognized that because it also changed the leadership. Otherwise, if he did not jump on what was happening, he would have just stuck with tradition. Um, and then lastly, for curriculum development, uh, integrating diverse art opportunities into daily classroom routines as opposed to large displays and presentations. It's always great to put it on the stage, to put it in front of grandparents, to put it at assemblies, but then it becomes a one-off and it doesn't become normalized. So if we normalize it, then we are able to infuse our own culture into the work and therefore have our voices heard even more. So this slide simply just uh, elevates the point that I was just making about representation um, about making sure we see ourselves, that we don't feel invisible with our work, and how we can use our social and cultural capital for our benefit and not just to elevate the environment that we're already in. Um, so this quote uh, by Naomi Pavin uh, on her Instagram page, she's an education equity advocate. Uh, she has a firm called the Pavin Firm. I just really like this quote, especially the ending where it says you have three choices, stay in risk, staying in a box, reposition yourself to another table, or create your own table. Things are not comfortable for us, or things that we uh, are fighting against, or being challenged, or exhausting. And that was a sentiment that I had working in PWI for so long, but after she colleague of mine, um, who is also a black woman um, who teaches math, uh, we talked about the uh, the difficulty of choosing, so to speak, working in a PW setting and then working in another setting where we might see more people who look like teacher wise and student. -wise. And one of the reasons I found it um, necessary to stay in the PWI setting and to have my voice break through was because I needed students and faculty who did not look like me see that knowledge and talent and skill and leadership come from people who do look like me. So I needed them to recognize that you can get the exact same grade A quality education, knowledge, talent, all of that from someone who does look like me as, some, as the vast majority of your faculty who don't look like me. So that's why it's important that as BIPOC educators, that we continue to push through and we don't leave the table, but we cut our own hole in the table. That way their table has to adapt. When they come to our side and sit in our seat, they have to deal with our part of the table as well. Um, so how do we do that? One of the greatest downfalls in American education and in almost any system is that we've always done it this way uh, because that is normal. It's easy. Why fix it if it's broken? Because, you know, if it's not broken, because it's already broken. 
and you just don't realize it's just like the picture here. Um, so I propose to do that through these four core goals of anti-bias education, which is identity, diversity, justice, and activism. You can find more information about that um, on the National Association of Education of Young Children, which is also on a handout in the passable session folder um, of all the resources that I pulled information from um, and gathered. Uh, for this presentation. So using these four goals, we're gonna go a little bit more in depth. So there's identity. Identity can be summed up with support, nurture, and connection. So it's about demonstrating self-awareness, confidence, family pride, and positive social identity. One way to do this is through the language that is used and developed for um, students and for youth. And that can be done from getting rid of words such as others, getting rid of words such as alternatives, getting rid of words such as non-traditional. So instead of saying, oh, traditional medicine does this, and then saying, oh, and non-traditional medicine does this, just calling it medicinal purposes or healing methods. Something that encompasses all of it so that you're not normalizing one thing over the other. Another way of doing that is connecting with the backgrounds of all the students in your classroom, not just the majority uh, of the students that are there. Secondly, uh, diversity. Um, diversity can be summed up in establishing what the differences are, establishing what the similarities are, and then finding a balance between the two. So diversity can be used to show how differences and similarities are done simultaneously and finding a balance through exploring both of those uh, sides of the spectrum. So this can be done through hiring, admitting, um, and inviting persons of different cultures and backgrounds to participate in different things in the school, to not normalize or tie things to European or American history. Um, this morning, Denise uh, from IBD said something about um, black dance being left out of the narrative um, and almost being like a side piece to uh, European styles of dance, especially uh, when you study it at the university level. So not side piecing our culture and our history, but actually embedding it and integrating it. Um, and another thing, another quote that I really like um, that came from this research was differences do not create bias. Children learn prejudice from prejudice. It's how people respond to differences that teaches bias and fear. So it's not learning about differences that's going to make you weary. It's not learning about differences that are going to make you weary. The third pillar for anti-bias education is justice. And this can be summed up with keywords of capacity, safety, and identity. So justice is something that's fostered when you are able to see the wrong and then you are empowered to know that the wrong can be righted. So this is also a reason why as BIPOC educators, we need to find ways to break through to right such wrongs. So not to circumvent them or not to leave them over there and then do our thing over here but to actually come into the fold, into the middle of it, and then right the wrong. So identify unfair experiences as they learn that unfair experiences can be made fair and increasing their sense of their own power in the world. This can be done through consistent professional development training, um, finding local organizations for uh, people of color that work in PWI, um, attending conferences of that nature, having an ultimate appeal to attention and action based on moral concern, not on leveraging where we stand. And then lastly, activism. Activism can be summed up for, as tools and action. So this is when, on that chart earlier for DEI, um, equity is tools. And then inclusion is the action, what we actually do. So this can be used as arts as an agent of social change and global citizenry. And then dismantling the past while reconstructing the present. So creating a toolkit, so to speak, 
of what students should learn and experience through the curriculum, how to create tools to resist tradition, um, how to create tools to reinforce uniqueness, and then how to create tools to broaden the understanding of equity or the understanding of what is right versus what is wrong. So with those four pillars, as well as with the information you heard um, about the survey, there are some questions that we can study and that we can um, brainstorm on in order to uh, figure out new initiatives or policies um, that we can use to integrate into our curriculum at PWI. Some of the things to consider, well, there's a lot of things to consider, but how do you, how do these initiatives amplify the BIPOC voice? How do these initiatives leverage white guilt to implement transformative work? And how can the community art sector be, become more involved? So that means how can the sector outside of education or traditionally certified K-12 teachers become more involved in bringing awareness and bringing change into K-12 institutions. A couple of other things to consider would be who might be left out of the curriculum, what ideas and misconceptions and stereotypes might children have about a topic that you can then dismantle um, and provide correct information to, which is a way of using our social and cultural capital. How can you strengthen uh, a child's innate sense of justice and their capacity to change unfair situations to fair ones? So how can you involve them in the process already as opposed to having them wait for the process to come to them? Um, also in Passable, you're, there's a handout in there also that I provided called the BIPOC Artist Bill of Rights. Um, it's something that I created for the school where I work. Um, based on certain students, uh, students of color that were called out for um, their body type and how they moved in dance class versus other students that moved the exact same way, but they weren't called out for their body type. So I felt there was a need for students of color, artists of color, um, students in the performing arts who are of color to be seen and recognized that there are certain rights that they have that need to be respected just like everybody else. For instance, they should not have to put their hair in a bun for ballet if they can't put their hair in a bun. Or they should not have to worry about wearing braids um, on stage. We should not have the same makeup that's being used in the theater production for every single person. Um, so just different initiatives that I felt we're being overlooked by faculty because no one was speaking with an, a BIPOC voice. And the students, of course, were in the minority, so they did not speak in their voice as well. Um, so there's like, I can't see this thing all now that I'm sharing it. I'm going to stop sharing. Can I do that? Yeah. Um, so with that, uh, there, I would like to see if there's initiatives or brainstorming that we can do um, of things that can be taken into PWI settings. Um, so whether that's using some of our social and cultural capital, whether it's creating a lesson or a way of getting guest artists of color to come into the environment. But I would like to see if there are ways that we can brainstorm together, so use the hive mind uh, process and figure out what it is that we can do. So, Njiri, is that how you pronounce it? It is? Okay, great, yay. <laughs> um, where do you come from for us? Like, what area are you in? Um, so I'm in upstate New York. Um, okay. Are you teaching at the moment? So I'm a museum educator at the moment, so a little different. Okay, okay. Um, so from your perspective of working in museums, I guess, how is it that you see tokenism uh, affecting your environment, especially if someone of color? Um, well, I think there's kind of the same 
concerns about voice and about when you're being asked to contribute. I think because some of my, a lot of my teaching is based around kind of collections, there's a way in which collections that belong to certain group, ethnic groups, and we have a large anthropology collection, um, are brought out for certain things, or um, certain people are asked to come when we have a certain type of exhibition or certain types of outreaches done that way. I think off the top of my head, um, we had an exhibition of ex, uh, indigenous Australian artists. And so uh, then they brought in, I guess, kind of the indig local indigenous community because they felt like they would be good people to greet, but it wasn't like we have a sustained relationship with them where their perspective is asked for in other times. Um, so um, I guess those are some of the ways in which I experience tokenism. I totally understood. Um, Kiana and Robert, do you guys have anything to add into the view, especially about amplifying the Black voice? So, so I'll, I'll share. Um, so I'm actually on the, um, can you all hear me actually? Because I was told earlier my sound. Okay, good. I, I'm just going to make sure I talk loud too. Um, so I, uh, I, I recently moved to the East Coast in 2018, um, where I, I've been teaching in Missouri for uh, about eight years at that point. And, um, <clears throat> and I, at, at, by the time I left Missouri, I was, I was the token everything. Um, I was on every board that one could possibly be on, whether that be um, the Missouri Arts Council, the Missouri Alliance for Arts Education, the Missouri Coalition of Teachers of Art. It was like every organization. And I honestly, I proudly sat on those boards because I didn't see anybody else on those boards that, um, that looks like me. And so it's interesting because when I moved to the East Coast, I got a, I got a gig in um, with DC Public Schools, but in uh, a predominantly white building. And, um, and it was interesting because I noticed the shift concerning why I was sitting at the table. Um, and, and, and so in Missouri, I felt like I, I felt much more welcomed at tables than you might believe. And I think that I think that in many ways it felt like Midwesterners wanted to do better. They just didn't know how to do better. And 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 in many ways they just made a lot of bad mistakes simply based on the fact that they wanted to do better. They just didn't know how. Whereas oftentimes um, with the building I'm with now, I, they know that they're making mistakes. <laughs> and they know, you know, like, like, I can't tell you how many times I've been the behavior room supervisor, or I've been, um, I've been, I'm, I mean, my classes have been stacked with, uh, with black boys, who they're, they're just new to the school, they don't know the expectations, you know, them. you're the better person for it. And so, so to go back to your question around amplifying, what I've learned, honestly, is that um, more times than not, I have more room to say more than I think I have to say. Um, a lot of the time, your organization really just wants somebody in that position. And a lot of the time, they would rather not have to um, train somebody to do what you do. So what I have learned, and I was actually joking about this to, to one of my uh, AAC people, is I've learned how to say every damn thing that I want to say um, in meetings, because I realize what it's like to be appreciated um, in, in multiple ways. And, and I'm learning that at the end of the day, um, I'm still a token. And so, um, and so, and so I have to, I have to, I have to be tied to the vision, not the organization. And so if the vision is that I want access for arts and music education that 
that tells the stories of black and brown BIPOC children and it is taught in a way that is equitable and it is taught in a way etc 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 do i want to be teaching black children and i want it to be in a space where they can hear their stories from somebody that looks like me absolutely however in the position i am currently in with the administration i have and the resources i have um, I've just learned that I just got to do what I got to do and I just got to say what I got to say to the children that are in front of me. I have had run-ins with parents because of it, because I've been blunt about a lot of things. I've had run-ins with administrators, but I have never, ever, ever lost my cool. I've never been disrespectful. I've never... Um, I've never raised my voice or changed my tone. I have always, the same way I'm talking to you, I will, I will say in a second to an administrator, I just wanna be, <laughs> I just wanna be clear that the next thing that we're doing is we're moving students from the center of the conversation. I just wanna be clear, is that what we're doing? Is, are we, are we shifting the focus towards what's easier for administrators? I just wanna make sure we're on the same page, everybody. You know, and, and honestly, I just don't care. And that, I know that sounds silly, and I'm at a point in my career where I cannot care, but like I care more about the vision. And if administrator and a, and a person on my staff feels like all I have to offer is just a heavy fist, then you know what? I'm going to offer what I can concerning that little piece of my personality, but more than anything, I'm going to offer what I actually believe in. And by doing that, I actually offer something real to the organization versus the fake bullshit that they want us to offer anyway. Um, so yeah, that's that's where I've been. And honestly, this session was so helpful primarily, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not wrapping you up. I'm, I'm, I'm simply saying that like, I was sitting here just like, I've been that token. I've been that token black man. I've been that token black. I've been that token LGBT person. I've been that token. Um, I, I've been I've been in t uh, the token a lot of boxes and trying to navigate all of those tokens. And again, I don't know what it's like to even be a black woman, let alone every time that something comes out of your mouth, you you all are angry and frustrated. And why are you? Why do you hate us? Why do you hate the organization? It's like. What? I didn't hear that. <laughs> so, so no, it, it, it just really validated this idea that like tokenism does exist. However, you can be at the table and still say something that's important, even though you know that the people looking at you at the table may not see what you have to offer. That's not important. What's important is the vision. And, and, and that's what I really learned. I really love that. Thank you for sharing. No, I absolutely love what you said about um, the vision, being tied to the vision, not the organization, um, and knowing what it is that you want to get across as your educator self, as your BIPOC self, as your purpose-driven self, uh, what it is that you are supposed to instill. And, you know, there, and like you were saying, Robert, you're like, you're at a point where it's like, I, I just don't care. I'm going to say what I have to say. Like, we are in a time, just societal-wise. Um, where we can't really, well, yeah, we can't afford to step on toes. Um, there was a, a, a meme yesterday that was like, ladies, watch out, you know, wear shoes because there's glass everywhere now, you know, from the glass ceiling being broken. And it's like, you're right. Like, the glass ceiling is broken. Like, I can't just walk. I can't be vice president. Like, I'm not saying to walk into work tomorrow and just be <laughs> And just start snapping in people's faces. But that is what we've taken on now. The sense of and not just empowerment, but the sense of uh, of influence, actually. Like empowerment is something that we take into ourselves and influence is something that we place onto something else. Um, so yeah, I found, I think that's extremely important. Uh, Kiana, do you have anything that you would like to add? Yeah, I um it, it's been interesting over the last few months. I, I'm in grad school and I'm trying to finish my master's thesis in communication. And I got the job at the Arts Council working as a student assistant in public affairs. So here I am in a communications role, also trying to finish my communication thesis. And then COVID happens, the protests start happening and we all recall in the summer when the arts organizations were giving out solidarity messages to black folks, but it felt empty. And our organization decided to, to offer a statement 
it came much later than the others. And even though I'm on the public affairs team, it wasn't until after it was already written that it was like, oh, we'd like for you to take a look at this. And from that point, I just, I, ha I felt burnt out at that point because I'm like, I've been here, I'm on this team. Yes, I'm just in a student assistant role, but I'm also a graduate student. It's not like I'm just fresh out of undergrad or anything like that. But as a black woman in communications where those roles usually are filled with white women or white men for that matter, um, you wait until you write this statement that didn't acknowledge any victim names. It didn't, it was, it was just lacking in so many ways. And I really, I really, I didn't want to offer my feedback because I felt like it wasn't my message that I should be putting out there. This should be the organizations. And if they want to put an empty message out there and get the feedback, that's on them because that's how they feel. Um, However, it ended up working out a little bit. It wasn't the message that I, I would have put out there, but the support with the support of our council chair, who is a black woman, lives in the Bay Area. We talked through it and made some edits, but I was just really kind of stuck and like, what am I doing right now? Like, is it worth going to school? Is it worth even trying to get into communications? Because there's always going to be this pushback. And then at the same time, I was also like, but where are the black communications professionals at? Like, maybe I can find them and talk to them about this process. So I know for me, like networking and just getting a better understanding of how it is for others like being in California yes everyone speaks to diversity but at my agency we don't have any black programs officers we don't I I'm not even in a career position I'm in a contract role we do have a deputy director who is black but our executive director is a white woman who you know she's still learning so it's been a lot of ups and downs but realizing as Robert said, it being part of the vision more than anything. And I, I do my own work outside of that, trying to make sure my community, my people have the access to the information to ensure that they know what they need to do to get that funding. So that is my story. <laughs> no, that's real. That's real, especially about um, who is in the organization. You're like, I'm there, but I'm in a contract position. You know, a lot of um, people of color in predominantly white institutions are in the DEI position or the multicultural uh, affairs office position, um, or in other nonprofits, they're in part-time positions where they work with youth. Um, not to say they're nice and wrong kids, clearly. I'm a teacher. I love kids. Um, but it's not like I can't make a financial decision either. <laughs> uh, you know what I mean? Um, or they're the ones who are asked to go uh, work with community partners, but primarily community partners of color because they need a bridge, basically. Um, and they're like, and you know, you can you can speak the language and you can go, you know, talk to the uh, indigenous uh, organization or to the Aboriginal organization you may name in Jerry. Like, talk, you know, like, oh, you you can form that that uh, bridge. It's like, so what if I leave? That means they formed the bridge with me. They didn't form the bridge with your vision. They formed it with me. <laughs> like, <laughs> in which case you might as well go start your own organization. I mean, like, <laughs> that is true, and that's true, and that's why I brought up that quote um, from uh, Noemi Pavan about there are three options that you have to stay and be put in the box and to deal with what they want to do. Um, to create your own table, which is like creating your own organization, uh, or to move to a different table in the organization. Which means like, well, maybe I just shouldn't be in this department. I should just go over here where I have more autonomy and I could do this on my own and I don't have to be bothered. But none of those things right the wrong. None of those things bring justice and activism into the environment to right the wrong. Um, so I see that we only have like a couple more minutes left, and I appreciate you guys uh, for sharing your stories um, and your information about how you experience this. But I just want to end on um, a couple of notes of one, 
even though it is apparent where you may stand in terms of tokenism, uh, you can create your own storyline within that group. So just like Token Black from South Park, his storyline wasn't developed, um, his character wasn't developed, but you can create your, char your character and you can create your storyline as long as you're still there. Like if you allow yourself to stay in the back, you, you won't get developed and you'll get killed off at the next table reading like in Scandal. Um, I always thought that was horrible that you didn't find out if you got killed off until the table reading. I thought that was rude. <laughs> then you're like, oh, I'm out of the Anyway, and so, so there's one, creating your own story. Um, two, knowing that your voice carries weight from other people and from uh, the knowledge and the experiences that you have gained throughout your life. So using your social and cultural capital to create that weight, that worth, and that value. And then uh, the last thing, thirdly, being able to influence and change the environment through activating your identity. So using those four core goals um, from anti-bias education uh, to change the environment, to right the wrong. Because the BIPOC educator voice is so rich because of our long history and because of all the history that hasn't even been unearthed yet, like literally because it's like buried in archaeology um, or like in ancestral lands that have like skyscrapers on top of it, like literally hasn't been unearthed. Um, that there's so much richness there that we need to keep fighting for our voices to be heard. So with that, I turn it to Kiana or Robert. I'm not super sure. It's me. Yay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for attending this session. Let's give a round of applause or a reaction of re applause, whatever you so choose, uh, for the wonderful Ashley McKinnon. Uh, Ashley may be available through private meeting function, which is available through Pathable. If you have any questions for her, you can send her messages there. Um, uh, a reminder, you will also receive a survey at the end of the day today via email. Please provide your feedback on this and any other sessions that you attended. I would like to let you know that our next session up is there's a break from 4.15 until I want to say 4.30. 30, yeah, 4.30. And then at 4.30, we have more affinity spaces. Please check out those affinity spaces. They are awesome. They have been fun. And then uh, we'll have our closing preliminary at 5.30. Thank you so much, everybody, for attending the uh, session today of Black leaders in predominantly white institutions and led by the most, most talented Ashley McKinnon. Everybody, enjoy your day. And don't forget to download the handout. <laughs> yes, don't forget. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, guys. I appreciate you. Mm -hmm.